Good afternoon, and thank you for coming. Um, obviously, you know, Ebola is, um, is in the news uh, pretty much every day now, and uh, it, it raise, has raised a lot of concerns. And as the minister has mentioned, it has uh, been an opportunity for us to review our basic infection prevention and control practices because we and we've had a number of rehearsals in Canada and and you know here in the NWT in terms of SARS in 2005 and, and the incidents around avian flu and H1N1 and uh, you know the the Middle East um, respiratory syndrome in the past couple of years so you know Ebola is another uh, virus that uh, somebody can contract uh, in certain parts of the world that may be brought back by visitors or by tr returning uh, Canadians who've gone there to visit or work. And um, it's another one that we need to be ready for. And so these types of preparations are something that we need to do on an ongoing basis. Uh, it's not just because of Ebola. And even today, NWT residents are, uh, you know, do travel far and wide and uh, they travel to different parts of the world and our system always needs to be ready to face those consequences. Um, the other uh, thing I wanted to mention is that Ebola, even though for most people it's, it sounds new, we've known about Ebola since the middle of 1970s. So that we have uh, you know, many years of experience, even though it's never come to Canada in the past. And we've been relying a lot on the uh, experience of uh, international aid organizations like uh, Doctors Without Borders and the Red Cross, who've been dealing with these outbreaks on an ongoing basis. Nothing of this magnitude, but there's been uh, you know, smaller outbreaks taking place in, in parts of Africa, like I said, since the 1970s. And um, that experience has been uh, gathered, and, um, you know, and even more recently, uh, Doctors Without Borders have, have treated over 6,000 patients in, in the, their field hospitals in the three affected countries. There are only three countries that are you know, where this outbreak is taking place right now in, in West Africa. That's uh, Guinea, Sierra Leone, and um, the uh, li Liberia. Um, and even though we, we hear from time to time of a, you know, a case like Senegal and um, uh, Nigeria had a case uh, in late August that was contained, and then the cases that were contained and they've been declared Ebola free since then, we heard last week of a case in Mali where a young child uh, was diagnosed with Ebola. But there's been cases in Spain and in Germany and in the United States as well. And um, when the system reacts appropriately and promptly, uh, you know, those cases do not result in outbreaks. There's no you know, further transmission. And that's really where we need to, uh, to focus our attention is having the appropriate right response. Um, the other thing, uh, as the minister mentioned, is we're relying a lot on the, uh, the pre-screening that is done for returning travelers. So we have, um, we've been told that there's on average uh, 30 to 50 uh, Canadians or uh, people with visas coming uh, from one of the three affected countries every week. Uh, there are screenings that are taking place um, uh, at the uh, exit point of the three countries. So they screen for anybody for, with symptoms that are not allowed to continue to travel. They're screened when they enter another country. So uh, that, that would be uh, the second place where the, you know, there's a check. There's no direct flights to North America. So people have to transit usually in, in, in Brussels. Uh, there's only one commercial airline that's still flies from uh, the three affected countries, which is um, the uh, Belgian airline. And so they, they, you know, that's where most of the travelers would transit and then they'd be checked at the entry into the European Union uh, countries and then they have to board a flight. To, so nobody with symptoms would be allowed to travel further wherever they're identified. In Canada, as was mentioned, we have uh, federal quarantine officers at every port of entry, not just uh, airports, but uh, seaports and uh, the um, and they, they would um, the you know the border agents would uh, ask uh, you know screen somebody anybody with a, who on their passport to have a visa that uh, you know shows that they've traveled to um, uh, through one of the three affected countries over the past uh, 21 days would be um, then uh, assess further, they'd be checked for temperature, they'd be uh, asked additional questions, whether they were in contact with 
um, patients with Ebola. So that would include uh, our own healthcare workers who've gone to volunteer and, um, and are returning home because people don't go there to work indefinitely. So they tend to work on a, on a shift for a few weeks and then they're, they're brought back home. And so the, anybody who's had contacts with patients would be classified as a either medium risk if it was just a casual contact or a high risk if they were providing direct care and may have been exposed to the virus. And those people are asked to um, interrupt their trip uh, and to um, basically self-quarantine for, the, for the, the balance of the 21 days of incubation. Those who are identified as low risk, meaning that they, you know, they might have gone to visit family, nobody was sick, they didn't go to a hospital, they didn't go to a, a clinic, would be um, classified as, as lower risk and allowed to travel back. But they still have to report back to, our, to us and then we can then check on them on a daily basis um, until the, the quarantine period or the um, incubation period is passed. Um, in the meantime, we've been uh, reinforcing our infection control practices in, in the t territories. We had uh, updated our, our guidelines in 2012, and there was a, in March 2012 that we had a, a basically a brand new manual that was distributed to all the healthcare workers and facilities in the, across the NWT. And since then, we have had a process in place to make sure that, um, because we have staff turnover, that there's an ongoing process in place in all our health authorities to make sure that people um, you know, have been fit tested to wear the N95 mask, that they know how to wear personal protective equipment and have the uh, ability to um, you know, identify what a higher, you know, a higher risk person who has a history of travel presenting with uh, symptoms of an infectious disease have um, you know, when they show up. And then they, they would be isolated. And then the, you know, the next step is actually to call my office. So if I'm on call or Dr. Candolo is my deputy. And then we would f further the, uh, the risk assessment and identify if somebody uh, might have been exposed to a, a highly infectious disease, which like I said, could be a, a SARS-like illness or an avian flu or in, in this case, Ebola. And then we would take measures to um, transfer those patients to a facility where they can be properly diagnosed and treated. We don't have here the capacity at our own laboratories to, um, to test for those diseases. And uh, so we're working closely with Alberta, who is our primary referral center. Alberta's already designated four of their hospitals as uh, Ebola treatment centers for the province, and uh, we have um, through our partnership, uh, we, we would have access to um, one of those facilities to transfer a suspect case and to have uh, the diagnosis done in one of their, uh, at the provincial public health lab in, in Alberta. So our, our goal would be really to, um, our focus would be to identify a suspect case early, make sure that they're isolated and provided basic care so that they, they you know, their basic needs are met, but not to, um, you know, to limit uh, further transfers uh, into wards, just be kept in a in an isolation room and um, and make arrangements with, with tra regard to transfer. And at this point, because of the limited availability of the specialized aircrafts, we would have to work through the federal government to arrange those transfers. So there's certainly a possibility that we would have to take care of a suspect case for you know a period of a day, you know, 24 hours, uh, uh, but. Uh, Again, they would be making sure that, the, that any staff that's assigned to work with those patients are, are well trained in the use of personal protective equipment and um, that we don't um, take the risk of contaminating our lab facilities or other parts of, of our facilities so that they're, they're maintained in one, one specific room. Um, and that the other processes around infection control for disposal of waste and uh, th you know, those things are being rehearsed and um, we have the, the capacity to you know, manage uh, the situation for a limited period of time.